A couple of weeks ago, we had a lesson on keeping the charge and the end of the charge. The charge that Paul is speaking of here is that we charge certain men not to teach a different doctrine and that we tell people that it is their responsibility and obligation to follow the scriptures exactly as they are revealed. And so Paul tells Timothy that he has left him at Ephesus for the specific purpose of giving him that charge, that he should charge other men not to teach a different doctrine and not to... <clears throat> And uh, not to add to the scriptures. And we saw in Revelation chapter 2 that Ephesus was very good at the charge. But they didn't keep the end of the charge. And Jesus told them, if you do not repent and go back to your first love, I will remove your candlestick. So keeping the scriptures pure is job number one for any church of Christ. But it is not exclusively to guard the gospel. The real intent is so the gospel can do its work. The gospel cannot save. The gospel cannot cause people to grow and develop unless it is pure, preached purely. But if we stop by only preaching the gospel purely and we don't take the time and take the responsibility to actually do the things the gospel has revealed, and so we look at the end of the charge, and it's love out of a pure heart and a good conscience and a unfeigned or faith unfeigned. So what exactly is a good conscience? I preached this lesson, I think, about 30, probably 35, 40 years ago for the first time. And I looked in my sermons this afternoon to see what I had on a good conscience, and I didn't have anything. I've never preached on this before. I've simply uh, allowed myself to understand what a good conscience is, but I decided this evening that I really wanted to break it down, and actually it's going to take more than one lesson. So we're, tonight we're going to lay the foundation for what a good conscience is, and I think there'll be some surprising things there. There were for me some things I hadn't really thought about before. And so as we begin, we need to realize that the term good conscience is used several times in the New Testament, but what usually happens is this. We get to Acts 23, verses 1 and 2, and we read, Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And then we take off on what a good conscience cannot be. Because Paul, of course, was living in sin, and Paul was persecuting the church, and Paul was blaspheming Jesus Christ, and yet he did it in a good conscience. And instead of actually breaking down and looking what the conscience is, we go to the mind. And we tell everyone, well, the conscience can't work unless the mind is fully educated and a conscience can actually take us in the wrong direction if, but wait a minute, what's a good conscience? What exactly is a good conscience then? I know what it's not. I know that it's not absolutely perfectly trusting your conscience, that your conscience will always take you in the right direction. And I think most of us are aware of that. Most of us understand that we've got to educate the mind before the conscience can work properly. But that doesn't answer the question. Do you have a good conscience? Does that mean you should never feel guilt? If you feel guilt after you have sinned, did you violate a good conscience? Does guilt have anything to do with a, a good conscience? Because if we are supposed to have a good conscience, and a good conscience, as Paul says, I have strived to live my life in all good conscience. So what exactly does Paul mean by that? And I think what we may find before this lesson is over is that the standard that we put it at is actually maybe a little too high and that we need to dial it back a little bit. And hopefully, as we go through this, we're all going to be able to say, you know, I've had a good conscience all this time because guilt has nothing to do with whether you have a good conscience or not. So as we begin to look at this, we ask the question, what is a good conscience? Now let's start in this verse. This is the end of Paul's statement. He says, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy. Now remember, the charge is don't allow men to teach error and false doctrine and human wisdom in the Lord's church. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you that by them you may wage the good warfare. It'd be wonderful to know what these prophecies were, but only Paul and Timothy and maybe the ones who gave it to him would know that. But look at verse 19. Having faith and a good conscience, 
which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered, have, excuse me, have suffered shipwreck. So faith and a good conscience are both necessary for Timothy. You see there in verse 18, this charge I commit to you, Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Now we talked about a portion of this warfare this morning, and that of course is the one within us, but now there's the one outside as well. The battle that we have with those people that Paul left Timothy to charge not to do what they were doing, because there's a great battle in the Lord's church between truth and error, and Satan of course trying to bring in false teachers and trying to bring in false brethren to hopefully move us back into the darkness and so Timothy and Paul and people like them, as Paul, if Paul's going to go on to say in chapter 2, verse 2, about three verses from this, the things you learn from me, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So this is a charge that is passed down from generation to generation. So, But what P Timothy needs regarding waging the good warfare is, first of all, these prophecies, which we don't know anything about. But then in verse 19, it takes faith. Faith that God's word has infinitely more value than mine. Faith that God's revelations are of a great, much greater importance than what I think or what anyone else thinks. And so we have to have this faith. We have to believe that every word that proceeds from the mouth of God is in the scripture. And that every word that proceeds from the mouth of men cannot hold a candle to it, cannot even begin to, to express the difference between scripture and and he's going to get to this in 2 Timothy chapter 3. But then notice a good conscience. Which some having rejected. So what did they reject? They rejected their faith. And they rejected their good conscience. And then concerning the faith, which would be the gospel, they suffered shipwreck. So the concept here is essentially, I know what I should be preaching. But for gain, but for value, but for a relationship, I'm going to modify my preaching. I'm going to change the way I understand the scripture because of the benefits that I can receive by changing that. And when you do that, you lose your good conscience. Because every time you read that verse, every time you read that verse from that time forward, your conscience says, I'm not doing right here. Now, same thing is true with any other doctrine or any other teaching, and we'll develop this a little bit later, but I simply wanted to make the point that this good conscience has something to do with waging a good warfare and with the loss of it when you are no longer teaching the scriptures as they should be taught. Here's another one, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Now, the other translations have, but sanctify Christ in your hearts as Lord. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. So here, Peter is saying that if you want to have a good conscience, there's two things you have to do. First of all, as he says here, you have to sanctify Jesus Christ as Lord or the Lord God in your hearts. Secondly, you have to always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, yet with meekness and fear. This is a very critical statement that he makes here, because sometimes we feel guilty. I know I do. You do, too. You meet someone on the street, and before you even have an opportunity to have an opportunity, they've passed you by. And so you're thinking, well, was that an opportunity? Should I feel bad? That person didn't get to hear the gospel. Maybe I would have had an opportunity, or maybe you try to get an opportunity. You tell them you're a Christian. You get out your card. Oh, I'm not interested. I don't want to talk about that. And, and so, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about those who are asking you a reason for the hope that is in you. So the line of good conscience, bad conscience is not, did I buy up every opportunity, but did I buy up every opportunity that was clearly an opportunity because they were manifesting their interest. So, sanctifying the Lord God in our hearts and always being ready to give a defense to everyone who asks us is part of having a good conscience. But then he goes on to say in verse 16, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, 
And here's where faith takes an interesting turn. Because from our youth, we have been taught that if a teacher or a policeman or anyone in authority disapproves of your conduct, you did something wrong. And you need to be sorry. And you need to fix it. This is what my parents taught me. It's what your parents taught you. Then when we become a Christian, suddenly we find ourselves in the situation Peter was talking about in Acts chapter 4, is it, or 5? We must obey God rather than men. And so now my conscience is kind of in a little bit of a flux because I know what God wants me to do. I know what man wants me to do. If I don't do what man wants me to do, I'm going to feel a sense of guilt because I'm violating their commands. But on the other hand, if I don't do what God wants me to do, I'm going to have a greater sense of guilt. So how do I have a good conscience by setting aside the commandments of men being defamed as an evildoer and being reviled regarding my good conduct in Christ so that they may be ashamed and not me. Now, again, it's not my purpose at this point in the lesson to answer every point of this. We'll come back to this probably next week. But my point here is simply to say that when we're dealing with a good conscience, there are certain critical indicators. Now, here's another one that's fascinating. There is also an antitype, which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. I've never really met anyone who came up out of the water of baptism and then came to me and said, are you sure, you're, you sure I'm saved? Now, I've had him come back to me six months later, a year later, a couple years later, and say, uh, are you sure I'm saved? Because after my baptism, I've kind of, I've really been struggling getting away from all those things that I thought baptism was going to get me away from. And then, of course, you have to teach them and train them. That, that's part of Christian growth. That doesn't violate your conscience at all if you properly understand the facts. But the point that Peter's making here is, is that when God says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, our heart and conscience feel uncomfortable. And at that moment, I have a choice. I can do what's necessary to keep the good conscience, or I can violate my conscience and live my life without doing what I know God wants me to do. Now, Peter says, anyone who rejects baptism will not have the answer of a good conscience toward God. Now, they can try to twist it and turn it and make it however they want, but the truth of the matter is, Jesus did say, he that believeth and is baptized is going to be saved. <clears throat> then in Acts 23, verses 1 and 2, we come to the passage that really creates an interesting clarification of the conscience. And I really appreciate that this is in here, and I'll show you why as the lesson now proceeds. Then in Hebrews 13, verses 18 and 19, pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably, but I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. So now this man, Paul, maybe, some other prophet, some other apostle, perhaps. He's in jail. He's in prison. He speaks of his chain earlier on. And so this is an individual who has a good conscience. Now, what's the point of that? Well, he's in prison. Maybe he's going to be put to death. He's being, mal he's being maligned as an evildoer, but his conscience isn't hurting him because he knows he's doing what God wants him to do. So, up to this point, and this is all the uses of the term good conscience in the New Testament. So now we start working on what exactly is a conscience. And I want to start with the Greek definition and the Latin definition. Now the Latin word is conscience. The Greek word is soon oida. Soon being with and con being with. And oida meaning to know and science meaning to know or knowledge. So the term conscience means a knowing with. In other words, there's something knowing next to my knowing. And it's an interesting concept. Let's, let's go ahead and develop it and then we'll come back and talk to this. A co-knowledge with oneself. The witness born to one's conduct by the conscience. We've talked about this a couple of times in the past that there's actually two things going on in our minds at the same time. 
And it's not that we have a split personality. It's that God has given us this specific mechanism that he calls a conscience. And the conscience is going over all of my words and all of my thoughts and all of my actions and all of my decisions. And it's co-working with my mind. And it's either making me feel good or it's making me feel bad. Now, if this sounds complicated, it's because it is. Now, here's the Thayer's definition. Joint knowledge, the consciousness of anything, the soul as distinguishing between what is morally good and bad, prompting to do the former and shun the latter, commending the one and condemning the other, conscience. Now, the only disagreement I would have with his point here is he's putting it in the soul. The scriptures don't really tell us where it is. It's not the soul. It's not the mind. It's not the heart. It's not the spirit. It's something working along with it. It is something that God has placed into our minds. There's nothing we can do about it. It makes us feel bad when we do something that our mind is telling us we shouldn't do, or we're not doing something that our mind is telling us that we should do. Now, he's putting it in the soul, and I guess it belongs there somewhere. But there's certain there's a certain thing in our mind that works along with, and the only way I know to really explain it is to look at Romans chapter 2, where it's explained. Now, he's talking about the Gentiles here who don't even know the law, who have so many wrong things in their mind, and yet here's what he says. They show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness therewith, and their thoughts one with another, accusing or else excusing. So the conscience is bearing witness within their heart of whether they are doing what they believe to be right and whether they're doing what they believe to be wrong. The conscience is bearing witness with that. So the conscience, my conscience, your conscience, and whether this is a good conscience or a bad conscience, we're not there yet. But what he's saying is, is that what the conscience is doing is... It is watching over everything I think, do, and say. And the moment that I do something that my conscience knows, and how does it know it? Because it's the co, it's the co, what, how did he put it? The conscience is the thing, well, let's go back to the previous definition because I've already forgotten what I was going to say. Joint knowledge, the consciousness of anything. So we have this thing in our mind. You remember the old cartoon of, uh, I think it was Pluto, the dog in Disney World. And he had one thing on this shoulder that looked like an angel with wings. And he had one thing on this shoulder that looked like the devil with a pitchfork. And then here he is in the middle. And this is pointing in this direction. And this is pulling in this direction. And here he is in the middle having to make the decision. Now, that's a, that's a very foolish way of putting it because there is no angel and there is no devil. There is only our soul and the decisions that we have to make. But what I've often wondered is, what's that thing in the middle? I mean, I can feel the pull to do what's wrong. I can feel the pull to do what's right. And then here I am in the middle trying to make the decision. And then behind all that is my conscience that's overseeing it all. And making me feel bad if I go in this direction and making me feel good if I go in this direction. And then in a split second, I have to decide which way to go. So as I say, it is, it's very, very complicated. Now, looking at it from another way, we see what Paul says here. I say the truth in Christ. So here's Paul, his spirit saying, I'm telling you the truth in Christ and I'm not lying. And my conscience is bearing witness with me. So where does Paul put the conscience? I'm telling you this, and I'm not lying. My conscience is also telling you this, and the Holy Spirit is also telling you this, because I'm speaking through inspiration. So, in the Holy Spirit means, Paul's writing this in verse 1 is inspired. 
So first of all, everything in here is inspired, which means whatever he's talking about bearing witness, the Holy Spirit is stamping it. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I'm telling you the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience is bearing witness. And the Holy Spirit is stamping it with divine approval. So what exactly does that tell us about the conscience? Well, I've got a mind. I've got a conscience that's bearing witness to the truth. And then I have the inspired scriptures that can tell me which direction that I'm going. So the conscience is working alongside of the mind. It's working alongside of the mind. Now, good or bad, it's there. And so as we now start putting some of these things together, so we begin with the mind. We take all the facts we know from the scriptures. We take everything we know in our personal life, the personal decisions that we have made, the responsibilities and obligations that we've shouldered, and somehow the conscience is working above all of that, assessing, making us feel very good when we do what we believe to be right and making us feel very evil and wicked and corrupt and uncomfortable when we do what we think is wrong. So this is the conscience. Good or bad will be determined by the actions that we, we take, but our, our conscience is overseeing. So our conscious mind really has no part here. When the conscience is functioning properly, it only oversees what's in the mind and bears witness with what I'm saying. So if I tell you something, and then I leave here and my, my conscience starts to say, wait a minute, Alan, you said that. Was that really true? You gave this illustration about something you did in the past and, well, you know, you didn't really make that as clear as you should. So there's the conscience. The conscience is kicking in now. It isn't just memory. It's the conscience saying, I'm a little uncomfortable. I'm a little uncomfortable with something that you said or that you did. And of course, that's when the mind starts going over and over and over it and the conscience is sitting over here watching as we do that and the conscience is not going to tolerate any rationalizations. And the conscience is not going to give us the opportunity to just let it go by or else we violate it. We have to do what we know is right. And so nothing in my mind can change its function to make me feel good or to make you feel good when you do what you know is wrong or make you feel bad if you do what you know is bad. <clears throat> so the only thing the conscience can do is accuse us if we are knowingly overlooking something that would change the outcome. So I make a conscious decision that I'm going to do something and that all the scriptures in my mind start to work. And this is how all of us function. The difference, of course, is how much knowledge is in our mind. The more knowledge is there, the more accurately the conscience can function. The less knowledge is there, the less accurately the conscience can function. But the point is that the conscience is working and I'm either fulfilling it or I'm violating it. <clears throat> well, I think that's... There we go. Well, let's go back to this. Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. What is he saying here? He's saying that he has never knowingly violated his conscience. When he thought the church and Christ were false, his conscience took what he did and said, you're doing the right thing. You're doing the right thing. If the church was a false religion, and if Christ was a false Christ, then Paul had every responsibility as one of the, as one of the Pharisees and a part of the Jewish nation who had the authority from the high priest, he was like a police officer, had every right to be doing what he was doing. And so he said, I felt very good because what my knowledge was telling me, I was living in good conscience. And that, again, helps us to understand two things. 
First of all, it helps us to understand that the conscience can be good even if I'm doing something wrong. It also helps me to understand that if I am doing what is wrong, and then it is turned out that I was doing what is wrong, becomes aware, or I become aware of, and now I feel the guilt of doing something that I shouldn't have been doing. But Paul says, I can do that and still have a good conscience. Now that throws a monkey wrench into the works because I've always thought, and I'm sure you have too, that whenever I feel guilty, I have violated my conscience. And I don't have a good conscience because I feel guilty about what I've done. But that can't be the case because Paul said, I lived before God in all good conscience until this day. And this was many years after Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And so whatever went on in his mind, when Jesus appeared to him, and we'll talk about this in the, as the lesson proceeds, it did not mean didn't have a good conscience. You can have a good conscience while you're going through the process of repentance. So let's see if we can develop this now. In Acts chapter 9, it says, Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand, and they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. And when Jesus appeared to Ananias to tell him to go, he said, go to the street called Straight, inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. He's fasting. He can't see. And for three days and three nights, he's praying. What do you think he's praying about? How do you think he feels right now? Wouldn't you say at this point his good conscience was obliterated and then he didn't have a good conscience anymore? That's how we might think of it, but that's not what the scriptures are revealing to us. The moment that we find out that what we've been doing in all good conscience up to this point and the guilt and the disgust and the frustration comes crashing down, we have not yet violated the conscience. The conscience has now been, well, I hate to use the word educated, the mind's been educated and now the conscience is on fire because what I've been doing that I thought was right, now all of a sudden, I know it's wrong. <clears throat> so Paul did feel guilt after seeing Jesus. He said, this is a faithful saying worthy of all accept acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now, how could Paul have a good conscience when he knows I'm the chief of sinners? Well, verse 16, I think, is the answer. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy that in me first Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern for those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now, why did he receive mercy? Well, let's keep reading. Whoops, that shouldn't be there yet. You know something? I think that verse I wanted is not there. Let's go back to uh, 1 Timothy 1. It's the second time in a day when I've done this. So let's go over to 1 Timothy 1 because I need to read this one verse. It'll probably come up later. Probably just not in the right order, but I need it now. So in 1 Timothy, uh, after Paul says that uh, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, he says, for this reason I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So let's go over there. <clears throat> Okay, let's start in uh, verse 13. Well, verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So Paul here reveals, I did have a good conscience because I didn't know it was wrong 
And the moment I learned it was wrong, I changed. So the guilt, the remorse, the agony, the anguish, the leavings of just absolute disgust at what we've done, that has nothing to do with a good conscience. So Paul says, I was always, my thoughts were never accusing, they were always excusing. My conscience felt good because what I was doing, I believed to be right. So Paul also says, he says it three times. I just want to make sure we see that this is not just one verse. He says it three times. Paul, looking steadfastly on the council, said, Brethren, I have lived before God in all good conscience until this day. In Acts 24, 16, Here and I also exercise myself to have a conscience void of offense toward God and men always. And then 2 Timothy 1, I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers in a pure conscience. How unceasing is my remembrance of thee in my supplications night and day. So the conscience is still good. David, when David committed adultery, it all came crashing down. I'm not sure David could say what Paul did because I suspect there must have, matter of fact, he admits there were times during his week, or excuse me, during that nine month period before the child was born where he said, my bones are just drying up and your hand is heavy on me and I can't sleep at night because he knew what he was doing is wrong. But then in the 50, or excuse me, the 34th Psalm, he says, I turned to you, I asked for forgiveness, you showed me mercy, now I have a good conscience. But Paul lets us understand that that period when you find out what you're doing is wrong. Well, what did Paul do? As soon as he found out what he was doing was wrong, what did his conscience tell him to do? Pray. So he prayed. When Ananias came, what did his conscience tell him to do? Why tarriest thou? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. He did it. The next day, he immediately got up preaching that Jesus was the Christ. His conscience Telling him now, I need to preach Jesus was the Christ. And that continued on. So Paul is able to say that that moment where I found out that what I was doing was wrong did not violate or change the fact that I had a good conscience. Now, Brendan, this is very important because, as I say, a lot of people feel very guilty about things that they can't conquer but that doesn't mean they have a bad conscience now let's keep looking at this i thank christ jesus our lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry although i was before a blasphemer a persecutor and an insolent man but i obtained mercy because i did it in unbelief but he goes on to say to me who am less than the least of all the saints can you have a good conscience and still feel low? Can you have a good conscience and feel like you're not worthy to even be a Christian because of what you have done? Well, Paul said you can. He says, to me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Or for I am the least of all, all the apostles who am not worthy of, to be called an apostle. So his entire life as an apostle, he felt unworthy. Can you have a good conscience and feel unworthy? Evidently you can because Paul never felt good about that. What was it? Six month period, two month period, two year period. We're not exactly sure how long from they laid the garments at the young man named Saul until Saul, Saul why persecute me? Don't know how long that was. Paul never felt good about that. And, and we can look back. I can look back on my life. You can, back, you can look back on your life. You can find times where you don't feel good about what you did. But that doesn't mean you have a bad conscience. 
And that's why we have to explore this. We have to look at it. Well, then what exactly is a bad conscience? It seems that having a good conscience is a little less stringent than maybe most of us were thinking. Paul said in Acts 21, I'm sorry, in Acts 23, I've lived before God in all good conscience to this very day. And yet here he's telling us, I'm less than the least of all the saints. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. I'm the chief of sinners. I was an insolent man. I was a blasphemer. And I've lived before God in all good conscience. That causes some reevaluation. I think we really have to start digging quite deep here in order to try to grasp what does he mean by a good conscience? I can feel guilty. I can feel low. I can feel that I have not done everything that I should have done. I mean, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, let's look at that verse before we, uh, we, we move on to the next one here. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, where Paul says, I don't even judge myself. He's not saying that a good conscience requires. Chapter 4, verse 1, Let a man so consider as the servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But me, with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself. Yet I'm not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts, then each one's praise will come from God. How many of us have felt like we have a bad conscience because there must be something I'm not doing that I ought to be doing? Or there must be something that I've overlooked. Apparently, having a good conscience doesn't require perfect knowledge. Apparently, having a good conscience doesn't require perfection. As Paul said in Romans chapter 7, O wretched man that I am! What I want to do, I don't do. What I hate, I practice. Yet I've lived before God in all good conscience until this day. So there's something there that maybe we're missing if we think, well, I don't know if I have a good conscience or not. Well, Paul knew he had a good conscience, and yet he was struggling with all the things that we're struggling. He's, he's dealing with all the things that we're dealing with, and yet he says, I have a good conscience. So we're going to have to develop this and try to understand, well, then what exactly is a good conscience? But we're not going to do that this evening. I just wanted to lay it out to us so that you can be thinking about it this week. I want us all to start thinking about, do I have a good conscience or not? And if I have a good conscience, what do I mean by that? Because, and if I have a bad conscience, what do I mean by that? Well, I feel guilty. Well, that doesn't mean you have a bad conscience. Paul said, I felt guilty. Well, I've done things I shouldn't have done and then found out later I shouldn't have done them and I feel really bad about it. Well, that doesn't mean you have a bad conscience. Well, I have this sin that I keep struggling with and I keep falling into. Does that mean I have a bad conscience if I can't beat it? If I'm still struggling with it year after year after year, well, these are things that we're going to look at next Sunday night and try to figure out what exactly then is a good conscience. I know what it's not. Now, we started with Paul's statement, I have lived before God in all good conscience till this day, and we've been able to explain and understand that it's because the facts that were in his mind were wrong, his conscience was working perfectly, and it was a good conscience, even though he was the chief of sinners. Even though I'm not worthy to be called an apostle, even though I'm less than the least of all the saints, I've lived before God in all good conscience unto this day. So whatever it is to violate our conscience and to have a bad conscience, it's none of those things. Well then, what exactly is it? Well, think about it this week and, and I'll do the same. As I say, I, haven't, uh, I don't have an answer yet. This, a lot of this stuff was a big surprise to me and it's, I'm just kind of going... Phew, maybe I have a good conscience after all. Isn't that sad that I waited this long? And maybe you're already saying, Alan, I already know the answer to this. Why don't you let me preach next Sunday night? And if you do, I would love to do that. I'll sit back and let you help us understand what it is. Otherwise, uh, next Sunday night, we will delve into this a little bit more and uh, see if we can come up with 
what exactly does Paul mean by that, since we know what he doesn't mean now. So as we now prepare to uh, pick up the Song of Encouragement, there's one thing I do know about Paul. As soon as he found out something that he did was wrong, he took care of it. And I think that's really where we're going to find the problem is when you know you should repent and you don't, now we're in a danger zone. It's one thing, as Jesus said to Paul, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. You know, Paul, that there was stuff in the back of your mind that was leading you to realize there's something not right here. You were kicking against the goad. But there came a point when he saw Jesus. Now, if he'd got up the next day and said, well, I know Jesus is there, but I'm still going to persecute Christians. Bang. Now we have a different situation. Paul never did that. And I think that's really part of what he's dealing with. And that's where our own struggle is. Because you can have a bad conscience. You can violate your conscience. As, as we're going to read next week, you can sear your conscience so it doesn't even work anymore. But not doing what Paul did, there's something else involved. And I think what that is, is going against your conscience when your conscience is no longer happy with what you're doing. Now something has to change. And Paul always changed it. And so if there's anyone here this evening who needs to change something, would like to prayers the congregation, or who would like to uh, unburden their soul by explaining uh, the difficulties so we can pray for you, we invite you to come now while we together stand and sing.